Welcome to our worship celebration at Evergreen Baptist Church. Hope you will enjoy this time of worship together. We're going to begin by singing when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. And soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. confidence that you have because of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the only way all of this that we've sung about this morning is going to be possible. And I pray that is a reality in your life today. Would you join me together as we pray and as we thank our Heavenly Father for this time of worship together. Father, what a joy, what a privilege it is to gather here in this place together with those who are with us here, for those who are, are gathered across our community and even beyond today. Oh, what a joy it is to be together, worshiping, studying your word, celebrating the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, together as the family of God. Thank you for that today. And I pray that you are lifted up, that you are honored, that you are glorified, and ultimately that you are pleased with all that we do here today as we sing, as we pray, as we give, as we study your word, and ultimately as we respond to the invitation of your Holy Spirit to come. 
to surrender, to obey, and to go and to give as you have given to us. Thank you, Lord, for each one. But Father, I also thank you for being with us in each part, in each moment, in each circumstance of our lives, knowing that through this past week and through recent days, even beyond this week, uh, we have been able to see the power and the persistence uh, of your work, your presence, your touch, your healing in our lives. And we continue to thank you for that, but to acknowledge our great need for that in every way, for the, for the physical healing that we need, so many that we know in our own church family, across our community and beyond, uh, in so many uh, different situations, Lord, needing your healing touch, your strength, the recovery uh, and, and the provision that only comes uh, from your presence. And we ask for that again today and for, and for that to be known and realized in each, uh, in each of these lives, in each uh, of these situations. Lord, for uh, our, our church, uh, we ask uh, for you to be here and at work. Uh, Lord, th this last year has, has, has turned things so far different from what we would see as normal. And very possibly, uh, we need to see that that's exactly what you are trying to do. Lord, direct our steps. Uh, give us uh, your word and your will for the work that you have called us to do. Open our ears and our eyes and our hearts to all that you are doing right here around us and the ministry opportunities and the needs uh, that are very real here in our church family, in our community and beyond. Lord, equip us and send us out for your work. And for our nation, we pray today and we continue to ask uh, for a, a reviving uh, presence of your Holy Spirit to sweep across this land through the offices uh, and the lives of those who are in positions of leadership all across this nation. We know uh, that it is, not, it is not these individuals uh, that can heal our land, but it is you. And Father, you have so often chosen to work through those leaders in places of authority and power. And I pray that you would do that in these days. And I pray that you would turn their hearts to you. And you would turn our hearts as a nation to you, Heavenly Father. Thank you. Thank you for the reminders that we will find, that we will read in your word today. Uh, that you are coming back. That you uh, will uh, come again. And that we must be ready. Lord, let that anticipation be very real and present in our lives. But also... I pray that you uh, would let that declaration be a part of, of our conversations. Not only that we would be ready, but that we would be doing all that we can to encourage and to challenge others to come and to follow Jesus just as we have chosen to do today. Thank you. Thank you for this great privilege. Thank you for the joy of worshiping together here in this place, in this time today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. My sin, oh, the 
bliss of this glorious thought my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. It is well with my soul. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend even so it is well with my soul Take your copy of God's Word with me this morning. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 is where we will be this morning in our journey through the New Testament today, talking about the surprise that shouldn't surprise us. The surprise that shouldn't surprise us. Now, that seems to contradict itself from the very beginning, but hopefully before long you will see what I mean. Because in the heart of our New Testament reading this week, hope you are reading along with us. This week we were in chapters 22 through 26. We begin in chapter 27 next week, five chapters each week. This week we hear Jesus give very strong, very intentional focus to his second coming, to his return. Uh, in fact, for the entirety of chapters 24 and 25, uh, he really talks about four major things. He talks about the signs of his coming. He talks about the sudden nature of his coming. He talks about the certainty of his coming. And then he even talks about the conclusion of his coming. 
Uh, and we, now we could spend the whole month of February right there in those two chapters, but we've got a lot of ground to cover between now and December. So out of all four of those, uh, at least for today, we may pick up a little bit more Wednesday night like we've been doing, but at least for today, what I want us to focus on is the suddenness of his return. And as I said a moment ago, the surprise that really at least for believers, at least for followers of Jesus Christ, the surprise that shouldn't be a surprise. So let's look, want to read one verse, uh, verse 27, and then we're going to move over to verse 36. Matthew chapter 24, verse 27 says, Jesus says, for just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the, the coming of the Son of Man be. And then in verse 36, he says, but of that day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but the father alone. For the coming of the son of man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken. One will be left. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this. That if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. The suddenness of his coming. The surprise that shouldn't surprise us. Why stop here? Why, why stop here in all of the, uh, the, the grand themes that Jesus is giving to his disciples? Well, I believe that the signs that Jesus talks about in the first half of chapter 24 are important. But I do not believe that, this, that, though, that, that place, that, that landing pad should be our primary, our priority focus. Why? Why? Because there are, there are some that spend a great deal of time there. And, and I don't want to necessarily discourage that. I just would say I do not believe that is where we should spend the, the bulk or the excess of our time. Because of what he says in verse 36. Because he makes it very clear that even though there will be signs, there will be indicators of his coming, no man knows the day. We don't know when it is going to happen. So, can we study what Jesus says about the signs of his return? Yes, absolutely. Should we stay there and stress the priority of knowing and recognizing and interpreting all of these signs down to the letter? No, no, I do not believe so. Because based on what Jesus says very clearly about the absolute suddenness and uncertainty of the day of his return, even doing our best to interpret and, and, and break apart all of these signs is not going to help us know the day or the hour any better. Instead, according to Jesus' command, and he gives us a command here in the midst of this passage we've read this morning, and that command is be alert. The word literally means to be awake, to be ready for his return. And that's what I want us to think about and talk about and focus on based on the pictures, the illustrations that Jesus gives here, really kind of describing what his return will be like, what's going to be going on, what's going to happen, be happening when he returns, and what's going to happen because of his return. Now, I'll go ahead and throw a word out here. I won't use the word much, but it's a word that is very often used in this conversation, and it's a good word. It's not a word we find literally in the Bible, but it is a word that is used in reference to the events that we are talking about. It's the word rapture, rapture. That's a a church word, it's not just a Baptist word, uh, but, but it is technically not a biblical word. Now it is a biblical theme. 
Uh, we, the word comes from the Latin word that was, that was used, that was translated uh, from the Greek. You find it in 1 Thessalonians 4.17 when Paul is writing to the church and he talks about the, 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 the believers, the church being caught up in the air with him. And that word caught up in the Latin uh, is very similar to what we now have as the word rapture. That's where that comes from. And that's not the only place we find uh, that theme. There are a couple of other places uh, where individuals were, were caught up. Uh, you remember um, Philip, I believe it was. Uh, you know, he was, he, was on, he was out with the, uh, uh, in, in the desert and he was, he was sharing the gospel with the Ethiopian. And then after the baptism, what does it say? It says he was caught up. He, he, he was gone. Uh, so, so this, listen, anybody that says that the rapture, uh, is not a, that rapture is not a word you find in the Bible, that's true. Anyone that says the rapture is not a biblical concept is basically saying uh, that, that what Jesus is teaching here is, is not true. Because, because it is. It is true. It is going to happen. And Jesus gives us some imagery here of what it's going to be like when it happens and even after it happens. So let's look at it. Let's look at it. We're going to look uh, at four different parts here as we go back through our text. First of all, uh, the verse that I read uh, separately by itself in verse, uh, verse 27, that imagery of the lightning, uh, that tells us just plainly Jesus' return is going to be sudden. It is going to be sudden. I can't tell you how many times, and if you're uh, honest, uh, you'll say the same, that, uh, that, that how, how often during a summertime thunderstorm, that clap of lightning and the, and, the, and the thunder rolling with it just startles you to no end. Uh, we don't have this situation here in our home now, but previously in homes with older windows, uh, the, 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 the single pane glass windows, uh, you, and you may be able to identify with this, literally when the lightning would flash and the thunder would roll, the windows would literally rattle. And, and, it, and especially when the children were little, it would, it would unnerve them uh, quite badly sometimes. Uh, but that, that suddenness. Well, when I read that, I, I had to ask myself the question, so how fast is fast? If, it's going, if, he's, if his return is going to be fast, sudden. Uh, when I was growing up, I thought, of, I thought fast was the roadrunner and Speedy Gonzalez on my Saturday morning cartoons. Now, that was fast. If I could get out and run, if I could get on my bicycle, if I could be as fast as the roadrunner, then I knew that I was fast. Then Superman caught my attention. He was not only fast, but he could fly. And I thought, my. Oh, if I could only fly. So then I would put a cape on, a blanket with a clothespin. That was my cape. And then I would get on my bicycle and I would pretend that I was flying while I was riding. My and then I started reading about people that actually did that. People like Amelia Earhart and Chuck Yeager and Neil Armstrong. And they actually did fly. And I thought, hey, maybe I can do that one day. Well, it doesn't hurt to dream, does it? What am I getting at? What am I getting at? Well, Jesus told his disciples that his return would be like a flash of lightning. He says, as, as the lightning flashes from the east to the west, so will my return be. So I got to wondering, well, how fast is lightning? Now, please understand that in just the few days of this week that I uh, been working specifically on this text and, and preparing. I obviously did not have the time to do the in-depth scientific study of lightning that I wish I might could have done, but I did find some interesting numbers from different articles. Uh, lightning is a rather complicated event uh, when you really get down to the, uh, to the, to the, the details of it. I mean, it, 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 it forms in stages. It, 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 has a, it has a descending bolt and an ascending, and it, it's, it, there's, there's so much involved. But, but, but basically, from what I've gathered and tried to compile in what I've read, the initial lightning bolt travels at about 220,000 miles per hour. 220,000 miles per hour. Now, to put that in context, I enjoy watching the space station when it flies over from time to time. The space station is traveling at about 17,000 miles per hour. A bolt of lightning, the initial, what we might would call the downstroke of the bolt of lightning, the upstrokes, it's said it travels actually even faster. 220,000 miles per hour. Now, that's just the lightning bolt. The light itself, the flash of light is actually much faster. 
You might think, well, the lightning bolt's going to the speed of light. No, it's not. It's an electrical charge. But the light itself traveling much faster. Estimates of around 670 million miles per hour. The flash of light from a lightning bolt. Now, obviously, there's a very complex process, and I encourage you to study things like that. Basically, all of this takes place in about one one thousandth of a second. If you could take one second and carve it up into a thousand pieces and pull out one of those pieces, that's about how fast a flash of lightning happens. Now, that's Fast. That, that gives new meaning to the term, didn't see that coming. Didn't see that coming. It's bright, it's loud, it's sudden. Uh, it's something that I've enjoyed here just because of my love of, of trains growing up. Uh, in, in, in my office here, looking out the window, I see the, the train track, and sometimes, several times a day, the train comes back and forth, and quite often I'm, I'm distracted and, and I have to stop and watch. Something that I've, I've uh, begun to learn how to do is to tell which direction the train is coming from by the sound uh, and, and by, the, by, the, by the, the, the horn that blows and, and, and the pitch of the horn. And, and I can hear it sometimes a, a minute or so if it's, if it's going rather slowly before it gets here. Uh, and, and I know that, uh, that if, I hear the, if I hear and feel the, uh, the rumbling before I hear the horn that I know it's coming south because I know the, 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 the last crossing is all the way uh, down past uh, in, in our neighborhood. So typically I don't hear that horn um, until it blows right here. But I feel the, the rumble. I know it's coming. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, describes the coming of the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. But listen to how he describes it in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, how fast is that? at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will all be changed. And of course, this is a very similar uh, parallel theme that Paul writes to the Thessalonians when he talks about the church being caught up, being raptured. We're not going to have time to say, oh wait, what is that sound I hear? I think Jesus is coming. Like we would say, I hear the train coming, no. As the lightning flashes from the east to the west, as, as quickly as the, as the sun uh, glimmers in someone's eye, the trumpet will sound and everyone will hear it. Jesus says, despite the many unknowns that there are to my return, one thing you can be sure, it's going to be sudden. It's going to be sudden. But then he pulls out an old illustration. He brings up Noah in the discussion and he reminds us that Jesus return, that his return will also be uh, standard. It will be on a standard sort of day. Now don't misunderstand me. Jesus' second coming will not be like any other arrival that you and I have ever experienced or will ever experience. That's not the kind of standard I mean. But based on what he says here, it will happen on a standard, regular Every kind, everyone going about their normal routine kind of day. Yes, there will be, uh, as he has already said, there will be some very uh, particular uh, notable events occurring. And those uh, can be discussed in different contexts and, and I believe uh, even drawn to different conclusions at times. But, but what he is pointing out here very clearly is, is it, it's not going to be like some sort of appointment that you make with your doctor. Where, okay, I'm going to go see my doctor at this particular time, or, I've, or I have this meeting scheduled for this particular day. It's just going to be a regular sort of day. Just like he says in the days of Noah. What was happening during the days of Noah? While Noah was building the ark, people were going to work. People were going out to eat. People were getting married and celebrating family get-togethers. They were also ignoring the message that Noah was preaching. 
You say, Noah wasn't a preacher. Well, yes, he was. He was a carpenter preacher, if nothing else. And every time he put a board on that boat, every time he fastened a peg, every time he nailed a nail, every time he refilled that bucket of pitch, he declared the judgment of God that was coming, the flood that was coming. In fact, you read in Peter's second letter, in 2 Peter 2, verse 5, Peter describes him as a preacher of righteousness. Every time he put another board on that boat, he was preaching the message of God. Hebrews chapter 11, we call the, the hall of faith. Of course, Noah is in that hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household. By, listen to this. As he prepared the ark by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. He was literally declaring God is going to judge the sin of this world. Every piece of that ark that went together. And Jesus says, when I come back, it's going to be just like the days of Noah. And yes, today, just as we are hearing today, there are many declaring the love, the mercy, the forgiveness, the salvation, the holiness, the judgment of Jesus Christ. But yet there are many that are just going about their way, going to work, going out to eat, celebrating family events, and ignoring the message. Therefore, we must be like Noah. We must be preaching the gospel with our lives, whether the gospel is preached on a street corner or in a classroom or in a secret church or under stained glass windows. It must be done with the expectation and the declaration that Jesus is coming soon. He is coming back. And a personal relationship with him by grace through faith is the only way to be ready. The only way to be ready. The only salvation in the days of Noah was the ark. That was the only salvation. You didn't get on the ark. You didn't make it. Today, Jesus is that salvation. Jesus is that salvation. So, his return will be sudden, and it's going to be on just a standard day. Thirdly, he draws another very strong picture here by telling us that his return will be selective. His return will be selective. Verse 40, 41, he said, there'll be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women at the grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. What's he saying here? Simply put, everyone is not going to heaven. I mean, there's just not a, not a complicated way to say that. Everyone is not going to heaven. You and I will have coworkers, classmates, friends, and even family members when Jesus returns who have not accepted his grace and mercy and forgiveness made possible through the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And when he comes, Jesus made it clear they will be left behind. And I don't know about you, but that's not something that I'm excited about. That's not something that I'm looking forward to. That's not something that I want to happen. What am I doing about it? Jesus gave his disciples and us other, uh, other descriptions uh, of what John eventually saw in his revelation of heaven. We, we see it on over in, in chapter 25, uh, which is part of our, our reading for this week. Look over there in verse 31. He describes it this way. He says, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. There will be 
as uh, the books and the subsequent movies have made uh, the statement very popular, there will be those who are left behind. In Revelation chapters 20 and 21, John sees a book called the book of life. And in it are the names of those who have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. But John is, is told very quickly, notices very quickly that anyone's name not written in the book will be forever separated from God in a place described as a lake of fire. Are you ready? Are you living your life in every possible way to help others get ready? What I mean is, are you bringing them to Jesus? I think back as a child, uh, when we would take our family vacations, and they were typically for several days, uh, most often as we would take trips to visit my extended family in North Carolina. And as a child, uh, I was so excited about those trips, but obviously I uh, had very little to do with the planning and preparation. Just didn't have the knowledge or the, or the ability to do that. Uh, my, my mom would, would, uh, would pack the clothes that she knew that I, I needed because she knew that if I was in charge of that, it would not get done. Uh, she often packed, uh, at least packed snacks and quite often packed a, uh, a basket that had food uh, for, for a meal uh, to stop along the way for a picnic. My dad would make sure the car uh, was, was in, 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 in the best working condition possible and filled with fuel and made sure the direction was plotted. All of that took place and, and, and you know, all I had to do was, was just get in the car. Now, as I got older, I was able to assist with some of those. But so often, still, even in those days, just as I have done for my own children and others uh, and, and, and through, through the years on different, helped them get ready. You know, that's, as a Christian, that's exactly what we ought to be doing every moment of every day of our lives, looking for opportunities to help others get ready. They don't have a clue how to get there or what it takes or what it's going to be like. Help them get ready. For Jesus to come. Ultimately, finally, ready for heaven. Oh, what a day that will be when my Jesus I will see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, he'll take me by the hand and lead me through the promised land. Oh, what a day, glorious day that will be for those who are ready. Well, ultimately, as we've already said, Jesus makes it clear that his return will be a surprise to everyone. Yeah, to everyone, it will be a surprise. I don't know when he's coming back. I, don't, I know he's coming back. So in a way, it won't be a surprise, but I don't know when. So in a way, it will be a surprise. What I do know is this. I know we're one day closer today than we've ever been before. And if the Lord tarries, and tomorrow will be one day closer than we have been ever before. It's going to be a surprise. It's going to be a, it's going to be a good one if you're ready. It's going to be a terrifying surprise if you're not. Jesus draws the illustration of a, of a homeowner knowing, which it sounds kind of absurd, you know, typically on a, in, in a normal situation, a homeowner is not going to know that a thief is coming. Uh, now, I, I enjoy occasionally watching uh, some of the, some of the, the, the law enforcement type uh, shows, uh, the, the NCIS and some of those. And, and, and one of my favorite parts is, is usually it happens toward the end of the program and they've, they've got the bad guy figured out and they know where he's going next. So they get there ahead of the bad guy. And, and, and he comes in and he thinks he's got it all uh, ready and he's, and, he's, and he's won the day and all of a sudden they all jump out with guns drawn, freeze. Why? Because they knew he was coming. Oh, that was, a, that was a mighty bad surprise for that thief, wasn't it? See, if you're ready, if you know that Jesus is coming and you're ready, yes, it's going to be a surprise, but it's going to be a good surprise. But for those who are not ready, it's going to be a bad surprise. We mentioned Paul's writing to the Thessalonians there in chapter 5, verse 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. And, and Peter makes this reference also in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. He says, For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. It will be a surprise. Are 
you ready? You're most likely familiar with this story, but let me tell it again, just in case. Horatio G. Spafford was a successful lawyer and businessman in Chicago with a lovely family, a wife, Anna, and five children. However, they were no strangers to tears and tragedy. Their young son died with pneumonia in 1871, and that same year, much of their business was lost in the great Chicago fire. On November 21st, 1873, the French ocean liner, the Ville de Havre, was crossing the Atlantic from the United States to Europe with 313 passengers on board. Among the passengers were Miss Spafford and their four daughters. Although Spaff, Mr. Spafford had planned to go with the family, he found it necessary to stay in Chicago to help solve an unexpected business problem. He told his wife he would join her and their children in Europe a few days later. His plan was to take another ship. About four days into the crossing of the Atlantic, the Ville de Havre collided with a powerful iron-hulled Scottish ship, the Loch Ern. Within approximately 12 minutes, the Ville de Havre slipped beneath the dark waters of the Atlantic, carrying with it 226 of the passengers, including the four Spafford children. A sailor who was rowing a small boat over the spot where the ship went down spotted a woman floating on a piece of the wreckage. It was Anna, still alive. He pulled her into the boat, and they were picked up by another large vessel, which nine days later landed in Cardiff, Wales. From there, she wired her husband a message which began, Saved alone, what shall I do? Mr. Spafford booked passage on the next available ship to join his grieving wife. With the ship about four days out, the captain called Spafford to his cabin and told him they were over the place where the ship had gone down and his children had perished. According to Bertha Spafford Vester, a daughter born after the tragedy, Spafford wrote these familiar words while on this journey. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, Thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. That kind of peace only comes when you're ready. And you're only ready when you know Jesus. And when you come to that place of a personal relationship by grace through faith, in absolute, complete repentance, surrender, and obedience to him. Are you ready for his return today? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the very strong but very clear reminder from your word today that we need to be ready, that you are coming back. And the only adequate preparation is to know you now, to have that relationship with you now because of the perfect sacrifice that you were for us, Lord Jesus, and because of the faith that you now allow us to place in you. Oh, would we come today? Would you come today? to that place of absolute surrender, to say before Almighty God, the creator of the universe and the one who knit you together in your mother's womb and knew every day before one of them came to be, would you say to him today, Lord, have your way. Have your way with me in my life today. I am yours, heart soul, mind, and strength, I'm yours. Do you have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ today? You can. It begins by coming uh, to that place where you admit that you're a sinner and you need a Savior and that Jesus is his name. And, and in repentance, by faith, turning from your way, to his way, from your will to his will, believing that Jesus is the one and only Son of God who came 
in the flesh, lived a perfect life, died on a cross for your sin, being, becoming the, sacri- the perfect sacrifice for your sin, for my sin, was buried and rose again from the grave on the third day for the forgiveness of your sin, for the transformation of your life, and yes, for the promise of heaven. And today, you can confess your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. That word confess simply means to agree. It means to say the same thing about Jesus that the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Today, would you confess your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? These are the first steps of being a Christian, of being a follower of Jesus. Those may be the steps you need to take today, but it may be that there are other steps, additional steps that you need to take of obedience and trust and surrender, following him every step of the way. Oh, oh, would you, as the hymn writer has written so beautifully, would you come before the Lord? Would you come before your heavenly Father today and say, have thine own way. Have the, I'm the potter. You're the potter. I am the clay. Lord, would you mold me, shape me, fashion me after your will while I'm waiting, yielded and still. Father, thank you. Thank you for doing your work today through your word by the power and the presence of your spirit. We give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Oh, what a joy it is to study God's word. What a a challenge it is to be reminded that he is coming and that we must be ready. And the only way that we're ready is through Jesus Christ. But we also have the mission to go just like Noah and to declare the truth of God's word, of his, of his grace, of his mercy, but also his holiness and his justice as well. I pray that is your heart. I pray uh, that is the direction of your life. And if there is any way, especially if you are watching us from a distance today, if there is any way that we can help you on this journey, take those first steps or other steps that you realize you need to be taking in your walk with Jesus, we would love to help you do that. You can get in touch with us in so many different ways through our website. You can call us. uh, You can stop by and visit us anytime during the week. We would love to have you worship with us here on Sunday. We gather for Bible study at 915 and then worship at 1030. And then we gather for Bible study time on Wednesday evening as well at 630. We thank you so much for being a part of this time and want to know that God loves you so much. And so do we. And we hope to see you really soon.